Welcome everybody to the next session of Remote Sensing Lectures in Pajamas. Uh, this time we're finally moving on to actual processing. We're pretty much done with all of our pre-processing now and hopefully we have imagery that's all corrected and enhanced and, and geo-registered and ready to go. And really I think the most common actual processing technique done with remote sensing imagery is classification. And the goal is just to be able to categorize the pixels that we have into themes that somehow are based on their spectral information or their spatial patterns. So the assumption is that the same features on the ground are going to have similar reflectance values and so we can group them or cluster them into classes of similar features. But there are lots of different ways that you can perform a classification with your satellite or aerial imagery. Um, I think the most traditional approach is to use this spectral pattern recognition, basically a pixel-based approach. And so when you're doing a spectral pattern recognition, really all that you're doing is using the spectral data to try to identify similar reflectance features. Um, but there are new techniques that also incorporate spatial pattern recognition. So this takes your pixels and it actually looks at their relationship to their surrounding pixels and uses that information to try to identify spatial patterns in the data. And sometimes this can be really useful, especially if you have one particular feature, say for example, um, grass, that spectrally may look very similar to trees or to shrubs, right? They're both green vegetation, but that the texture um, of that the pixels will look very different and so we can use that information for some spatial pattern recognition techniques. Um, there is also uh, a technique using temporal patterns so you might utilize multiple images from different dates and use that as additional information to help uh, inform or distinguish between what might otherwise have been similar features and a good example of that would be um, trying to distinguish different tree species. So we know that different species will leaf out or will start to change colors in the fall at, with different timing. And so if we were looking just at a growing season image, it might be very hard to distinguish, uh, say for example, a sugar maple from a beach. But if we can include uh, a fall image, we can start to really pick those apart by having those temporal patterns included in the classification. Really the best though are these hybrid classifiers which utilize all of these approaches in conjunction. They're all done in tandem. Um, and these really are what are providing the most accurate classifications out there. For this lecture and this week's lab, we're going to try to keep it uh, condensed and focused so that it doesn't take us forever to cover the material because you really could spend an entire semester going over different classification techniques. Um, so we're going to focus on those pixel-based classifications right now. And even among the pixel-based classifications, in other words, where you're just using the spectral information to try to identify um, objects with like reflectance features, um, there are still different ways that you can approach that, different mathematical algorithms that you can use. Um, and we'll try each of these. There's an unsupervised approach, which in very simply just means that you let the computer itself run its own algorithms and identify what it thinks are the unique spectral classes. Right. So this is again based purely on the spectra and the statistics within each of your bands. And then after that's done, you as the analyst have to go back in and figure out what each of those computer identified classes actually are. So that was the unsupervised. The supervised classification means that you know on the ground where specific features are that interest you. And so you can actually train the software to look specifically for those reflectance signatures. In other words, you're training the software to look for a very particular uh, reflectance feature. So this is supervised, meaning that you are providing initial information to train the algorithms, which are then used to classify the rest of the the hybrid approach really uses both of these unsupervised and supervised algorithms and it doesn't do them simultaneously. Typically what you will do is run 
one of them first. So for example, I might run an unsupervised classification and then I might go in to the classes that are chosen and use a supervised classification to refine those object assignments within each of those classes or to figure out if I should lump different classes together. So again, it's not that they're literally used simultaneously, it's just that you would run one first and then the other to refine it. And these are especially valuable when you do have a lot of variability, reflectance variability within your image. Let's break these different algorithms down a little bit more so that you understand what they're doing. That unsupervised classification really is making an assumption that if you were to plot out all of your pixels in n-dimensional space, however many bands you have, that like objects would tend to cluster together in this spectral dimensionality. And so you could very easily distinguish one type of surface feature from another one. Right? And so we have different ways of mapping out our spectra in this multidimensional space and then figuring out where each of these different clusters lie. And this right here, this picture, it, it never looks like this. If you were really mapping out every single pixel in an image, we know we have a lot of mixed pixels. And so you're never going to see these lovely little balls. Instead, you might see clusters of uh, concentrated pixels that are graphed in that n-dimensional space. But there's always going to be a ton of extra pixels all throughout here. And we have to figure out which one of these clusters all of these other sort of in-between pixels might belong to. So the very first step in this unsupervised classification is running an algorithm that's called an isodata algorithm. And literally all that this is doing is it's plotting out your pixels into this n-dimensional spectral space and trying to identify clusters within that. And before an isodata algorithm will run, you do have to give it some information. It needs to know how many clusters you expect to find in your imagery because if you say, for example, example, we're only interested in distinguishing land from water, then you wouldn't want it to pump out 50 different clusters um, to tell you every single type of water and every single type of surface feature on the land. So you really specify how many classes it should be clustering into. And then you have to specify how many times it can reevaluate the statistics based on those clusters it's created. So essentially it's going to go through our pixels once and look at all of their statistics and it's going to make some decisions about where which cluster each of those pixels should fall into. But then the clusters themselves will have new statistics. There'll be a new mean and standard deviation for each of those bands because you've essentially added new pixels to them. And so what it'll do then is go back and rerun the ISO data to see if based on these new statistics for each cluster, if the pixels that were floating around sort of an in-between spectral space would be uh, classified to a different cluster than they had originally. So you're going to specify how many times the algorithm is going to do that. It's going to keep you know, going back to the pixels, re-examining them and reassigning them as the clusters change. So that's called our number of iterations. And obviously, the more iterations you pick, the longer it takes to run that isodata algorithm. So usually you try to pick something that gives you enough replication and refinement but doesn't take all day to run. And then you also have to specify um, sort of a, this percentage of pixels threshold that you can say, all right, if you hit a point where 95% of our pixels stay the same when you rerun that next iteration for the isodata algorithm. So if most of them don't change, then you can just stop the iterations. So that's actually sort of a catch to say, you don't have to keep iterating this if the statistics never change and the pixels aren't classified to different clusters based on those changing statistics. So with these three pieces of information, what the software does is it starts with your very first pixel, that upper left XY pixel in your image. And it uses that as your first class and essentially then moves to the next pixel and looks at its values and based on some thresholds, spectral distance thresholds, it decides whether or not the second pixel is similar to the first and therefore should be grouped with the first cluster or whether it's distinct enough that it should be considered a second cluster. And then it goes on to the third pixel and does the same thing. And so essentially what it's doing is it's moving through this image pixel by pixel is it's looking at each new pixel value and it's comparing 
comparing it to the mean cluster value for the different objects it's identified, for the different clusters it's identified, and deciding whether this new pixel that it's on is spectrally similar to that cluster or spectrally similar to maybe a different cluster, or if it's unique enough that it should be called its own new cluster. And each time a new pixel is added to a given cluster, the statistics for that cluster are updated. So as the algorithm is moving through the image, the clusters are constantly changing in terms of what their mean values are for each band and the standard deviation for each band. This is why you have to run multiple iterations of this isodata algorithm because the first time through those statistics for the various clusters are still being built and if you went back through a second time after you'd been through the entire image for that first round of classification then you might find that pixels actually fall into a different cluster than they did originally because maybe that cluster didn't exist or at least didn't exist in its current form when it went through the first time basically just from left to right like reading a book through that image. If we were to look at this in its simplest form where we just have two bands, here we're just using band 4 and band 5 so we're in two-dimensional space and our minds don't explode, but imagine that you might have a cluster with a mean and standard deviation um, of 10 and 10 on your your x and y axes and a zero standard deviation, but as the algorithm goes through and keeps adding new pixels to that, the mean for that cluster may shift and the standard deviation is also going to change. And so it keeps doing that as it's moving through um, the pixels in the image and new pixels are being added until ultimately you may end up at a new set of statistical values for that cluster. Right? And the idea is that hopefully by the time you've gone through the entire image, you would be close closer to the true mean and standard deviation for that cluster, which is related to some group of similar objects that have similar reflectance features. Another way to visualize this is to actually imagine that every single pixel in your image were plotted out in this two-dimensional space. So what's in blue here represents essentially a histogram of band values for each of the pixels in our entire image. So this is sort of like a, a distribution, a, a probability density distribution for all of our pixels. And in this simplified version, we're asking the isolated algorithm to give us five classes, one, two, three, four, five. So take all of these pixels and somehow group them into five distinct classes or surface objects. And so the first time through, it may end up with these means and standard deviations. So the, the ellipsoids are showing us this plus or minus two standard deviations. And it does break apart the histogram quite nicely, but you can see that we're missing lots of pixels. So there would be a lot of what we call unclassified pixels based on just this first iteration. And so it needs to be refined to really represent the distribution of what reflectance uh, would look like for this object represented by this cluster. And so on the second iteration it can refine that a bit. The mean might shift a little bit and the standard deviation can also shift to try to better approximate truly how those different objects um, are distributed across the full histogram. And as you go through these iterations time and time again you're essentially refining the area that these clusters occupy. Once all of these clusters are established and they have some solid statistics to start with, this is when the isodata algorithm starts to repeat itself and run through these iterations to see if um, those refinements could improve your representation of all of the pixels in the image. And that's where this percent unchanged comes in and where we use that as one of our thresholds because if you get to a point where within your iterations you stop seeing reassignments of pixels, then it probably means that you have pretty representative um, statistics for each of those clusters. Right? So based on a certain number of classes, um, we want to know how many of our pixels change cluster when we either split or merge those clusters or reassign pixels to those clusters. The algorithm will keep running until uh, one or both of our thresholds were met. It was either a maximum number of iterations, which here I'm going to guess might have been probably 20 because it certainly went beyond 10 iterations, and then also um, the other threshold that could be met is the percent of pixels that remain unchanged when you ran through that next 
in an iteration. So here it must have been set at 98% as a threshold to stop running the iterations. What you end up with that comes out of this ISO data algorithm is a one-band thematic image. So when we say thematic, we're talking about each pixel now having a class value instead of having a continuous number value associated with it. So you could never have um, output from an unsupervised classification that had a pixel value of 1.2745 or 0.872. That's a continuous variable. These are just straight classes, so they can have a value of class 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's it, just integers. And this is only one band, and it usually is spit out in a grayscale. So the brighter colors would represent some surface feature that we don't know yet. Remember, this is unsupervised, so it's not necessarily, um, necessarily true that whatever comes out as the bright in our grayscale was also bright within the image. We have to go in and figure out what each of these different shades of gray um, are telling us. And we do this within the classification uh, tools in our software packages where we basically explore around the image this new thematic ISO data output image and compare it visually to the original image and use our human brain and our analyst skills to interpret what it is. And then we can actually assign what was called just a 1 in the pixel value. We can assign it to a very specific object, a feature type. And we do this within the raster attributes editor. So again, you'll see this in lab. Um, don't worry too much now. But what I do want you to see is that what ends up happening often is you see a lot of spectral variability even within what you as an analyst would have called one type of surface feature. And so as an example here, you can see that there are one, two, three, actually there were four different output thematic values or clusters that were really forest, just different types of forest, but they were grouped as four distinct clusters within that initial um, isodata algorithm. So we can go in and by exploring what each of these different uh, colors or these different thematic values were, we can assign them all to the same true class, which was forest. And ag was similar here. There were actually three different um, output isodata clusters that in truth were all agriculture, but they were slightly spectrally distinct. For our purposes, we just wanted to identify ag versus forest versus urban versus water, so we have to actually merge those together. In addition to looking at each of those output clusters visually in the thematic image, we can also go into the statistics for each of our clusters and examine whether or not they really do seem to be spectrally distinct. And there are a couple of different tools that we can use to do that. We can just look right at the base statistics for each of our clusters, that mean and particularly the standard deviation. We would expect the means uh, to differ. But the standard deviation is telling you how much variability in pixels your cluster is representing. And we know that surface objects, even when they're, the, when they're the same thing, can be very different. There's a lot of variability in spectral reflectance. And so the general rule of thumb is that if you see a standard deviation for your cluster that is either less than 1 or greater than 9 for any one of these classes, so each row is a different cluster or a different class, if you see those really low or really high standard deviations, you likely have a problem. So so what that low standard deviation is telling you is that the pixels in that cluster are so similar that it's not really representative of how nature works. And it's likely that you are missing the variability and you're, you may be missing some of those objects that you're looking for and are not capturing them. If you see variability that's really high, that indicates that you probably have more than one object or feature type within that cluster and so you probably should go in and think about trying to split that apart um, and break that one cluster into multiple clusters that are more uh, similar to each other. The other metric that you can use um, is called separability and this is written into an output file when we run that isodata algorithm that we can open up and it's actually a special mathematical analysis that tries to quantify how spectrally separate or unique 
each of your different classes are. So all of your output classes are listed here and you can actually come into this table and look and see each class compared to each other class. So this very first um, position in the array of data values is comparing cluster 1 to cluster 2 and it calculates how separable those two clusters are for each other. So you would actually examine every single cluster compared to every other cluster and you would like for this separability value to be at least 1600 for each of those possible pairs of clusters. Where you have values, separability values less than 1600, that is where you would likely want to go in and try to refine your classification um, or perhaps go in and merge different clusters. So in other words, if they're not truly very separable, maybe they are the same surface feature and you should group those two clusters together. The concept of looking to maybe merge pairs that are less than a 1600 separability value is pretty straightforward, but reading the output is not that easy. So here's an example. We're going to zoom in a little bit. What it's telling you up in the top array is basically which set of pairs it's comparing. So this would be the first cluster to the second cluster, and then the first cluster to the third cluster, and so on and so forth. And the order that these are in in this upper array is the same order that their scores are reported down below. I know this is kind of counterintuitive. I'm not sure why they couldn't have just two columns with the pair and the score, but anyway, they don't, so let's figure out how to read this. If I'm looking down here through my separability scores and I see scores that are below 1600, my 1600 threshold, so I know that if this is the, let's see, one, two, three, the fourth column over, and one, two, three, four, five, and the sixth pair down, the sixth row down, that means I would go over four columns up above, one, two, three, four, and six down, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this low separability is four pair, five to six. So that tells me that I might want to go back in and look and see what five and six are classified as in the actual image and see if they should be merged into the same group. Um, the ones that are closer to 1600, you maybe have to examine a little more carefully. Again, the ones that are above 1600 but aren't quite at that 2000 mark, you might want to examine those as well to see if those might also be merged. Um, but the idea is that the closer you get to that 2000 mark, the more spectrally distinct your different clusters are. And that's good because it means it's going to be easier for pixels to be classified into one or the other instead of falling somewhere in between and, and perhaps being classified into the wrong cluster. So now you've run your ISO data unsupervised algorithm to identify statistical clusters of similar reflectance values. And then you've gone in and you've looked at that grayscale thematic image to see if different clusters look like they're the same surface feature or whether or not you have confusion among surface features within one cluster. You've looked at your basic statistics for each cluster and examined that standard deviation to see if you have clusters that are either too homogeneous or too variable based on that standard deviation. And you've gone in and you've looked at your best minimum separability um, with those separability values. And so based on that, you now have options. You can, you know, keep a little notebook and make track, keep track of the clusters that you're happy with and the ones that you need to examine more closely. And then what you have are basically two options for these existing clusters. You can either go in and merge those clusters. So if I find two different clusters that are spectrally similar and in fact are the same broad category of surface feature, I can go in and merge those two classes so that their statistics now become combined. So when I run this sort of final algorithm, those two classes will just be assigned to the same final class. And we do this through recoding. The other option is to do what we call cluster busting, which sounds a lot more fun. With cluster busting, we basically isolate all of the pixels in our image that belong just to that one cluster. And we rerun the unsupervised classification, but only on 
those pixels that are in that one cluster. And because we have a more homogeneous group of pixels in the image, in other words, it's not the entire image, it's just that one cluster, the statistics are going to be more refined and are going to look for smaller distinctions between the statistics of those pixels. And so it will essentially create another second classification with that one cluster now bust into multiple clusters. And then we can go in and examine those and decide which of those should go back into the original classification. So in this way, just to give you an idea of this whole problem, an unsupervised classification is actually a whole series of different activities. We start with just running that ISA data algorithm, and even the ISA data algorithm itself is iterative, right? Remember, we took we set thresholds for how many iterations should be run within that one algorithm. So it's going, it's looking at pixels, it's assigning them to clusters, examining their statistics, and then updating the statistics as new pixels are added. It goes back within itself, all within the same activity running the ISA data, and it reassigns pixels to clusters based on the new statistics, and then it goes through the whole image and does it again until it reaches its maximum number of iterations or the convergence threshold that you set for the number of pixels that should change or remain um, this in the same cluster. So that's just one step. Once we've gone, done that iterative ISA data algorithm, we go in and we evaluate the statistics associated with those clusters to make sure that when it goes through the rest of the image to assign those final classifications, that those clusters really are distinct, not too variable, not too homogeneous, and that they represent real surface features that we're looking for in our image. And based on these statistics, we might decide to go back and rerun the ISA data either to merge clusters or to bust apart existing clusters. But then once we get to a point where we're happy with the cluster separability uh, within our ISA data algorithm, we then have to make sure that each of those clusters is assigned to the proper cover type, right? The right surface feature, because remember, when ISA data algorithm spits out this classification, this thematic map, we have no idea what class 1 is or class 2. So this is our, our opportunity to go in and examine that thematic layer against the original image and identify and label what each of those different clusters actually are. And this is a second opportunity for us to merge clusters together if we find that they're really representing the same broad category of surface feature that we were trying to differentiate within um, for our objectives. Now a lot of people stop at this point. They have a beautiful thematic map, uh, it looks very interesting, lots of different colors. You can assign colors to the different surface features. You're going to see some nice variability in there. And this is, if there's one thing I want you to take away from this class, it's that just creating a pretty output image is not the goal. No classification is complete until you have actually evaluated that classification by performing an accuracy assessment. And we'll talk about how to evaluate um, the accuracy of a classification in our next week's lab. It's important enough that we're going to spend um, some more time on it. So the, my, my joke, the way I like to think about it, is if you see an image, a classification, or any kind of biophysical modeling or representation of what's happening, processes on the ground, and it doesn't include some accuracy assessment, it really is no better than a pretty picture. It's eye candy. It's kind of like geo-porn. So don't ever let yourself be sucked into that of, oh, I've made a pretty map, I'm done. You always have to include um, an accuracy assessment to go along with that. And this should be the final step in any classification. I know that sounds complicated, but really the unsupervised classification is one of the quickest and easiest ways to get a meaningful classification out of your initial raster image. It's objective, right? I mean, it's just running this based on statistics, so there's no analyst bias in the process. It does run pretty easily and quickly on our computers. It's not necessarily a super complicated algorithm. It doesn't need a whole lot of input from you to initiate. Um, it gives you a pretty good idea of how much spectral variability you have within your entire image as well. So in, in addition to actually 
for doing the classification, it tells you how much variability you might have within your surface features that you're trying to identify. And that's not something you may have known um, inherently. So for example, forests in our region may be in Vermont may be slightly less variable than forests in say Pennsylvania just because we tend to have uh, more homogeneous stands a higher concentration for example of sugar maple whereas perhaps they have more oak hickory forests with a spattering of tulip poplar um, so it really is kind of useful to learn more about the area the location that you're in the problem is it may be identifying surface features that you're not interested in so you're going to have to take time figuring out how to merge those um, it may not pick up on very uh, very unique surface features that you're looking for so in other words if they're not a really common uh, object and so there aren't a lot of pixels to be clustered they may end up just being lumped into um, another one of the clusters so there are there are pros and cons to running an unsupervised classification but it, it certainly is a very common approach to a first pass of classification at the least um, and then if the analyst feels that it could be improved, they might take a hybrid approach and then go in and run a supervised classification on some of these clusters to improve them. And we will move into that for our next video. So stay tuned.